this is a point of desperation for for President Putin. He has clearly been uh, receiving at best filtered reports of how badly things have been going in Ukraine. He's clearly aware that they're not going well. Putin is trying to um, sort of walk an almost impossible tightrope between the various different factions within Russia that he needs to keep on side, in effect. I mean, not necessarily on side, but at least keep passively supportive which is that the public are he, he, clearly that they're, they're still talking about partial mobilization. They're saying that no students going to be called up and it's just going to be people with former military experience. You know, whether that's true or not in practice is very, very questionable, but clearly they're scared of the public reaction from overtly saying, we're going to go onto a full war footing and we're going to mobilize everybody. The, it's part of the long-term bargain that, that Putin struck with the Russian people was that he would make Russia a great power, but they would be able to go about their lives as normal. Um, in the background. And you saw that, for example, one of the first things he did when he took power was to uh, suspend large-scale conscription. Um, it, it's it's part of the inherent bargain there. So he's trying to give the military what it desperately needs, um, but it's six months too late, which is enough manpower or a source of manpower to allow them to man this enormously long front line. It's still nearly a thousand kilometers of front line. Um, and to take these objectives, which even with the filtered information he has, he knows they're not taking. Um, but it's not enough to do that. He's trying to keep the people happy-ish by not going to full mobilization, but with the panic we're seeing in terms of small protests in various places, planes booked up, people trying to leave the country. Um, clearly, that's not going very well either. He's okay. also trying to keep the hardliners uh, both in the media and the kind of the broader security apparatus who've been demanding a war footing for months, happy by saying, well, we're, well, now we're, we're getting the escalation. Now it's all getting serious. We're taking this seriously. And he's also trying to, to uh, strike a balance with the West by dangling the kind of nuclear threats um, to, to reinforce deterrence there, um, pushing this annexation line and saying, well, this is now part of, this is going to be part of Russia. Um, and so, you know, we, we defend it as if it was part of Russia. The Ukrainians are very unlikely to blink there. So it's probably aimed at the West in terms of trying to get Western countries to fracture in their continued support, trying to convince them this is a new line. So now when they support Ukraine re re-establishing re control over its lost territory, that it's an attack on Russia itself. The result of trying to balance so many things at a, from a position of extreme weakness, let's be clear. Um, this was supposed to be a short, triumphant war where they took Kiev in a matter of days and brought Ukraine back into the Russian sphere of influence. Um, you know, it couldn't be further from that, the way it's played out. You know, this is a position of desperation. It's not likely to be terribly effective, but it certainly pushes him further into a corner. And in that sense, it's fairly dangerous in terms of cornered animals are dangerous. We are now seven months, nearly seven months to the day into the war in Ukraine. You mentioned there the escalating risk and the threat of uh, Putin's threat of uh, using nuclear weapons. I mean, how realistic is that? And how, I mean, how does the West currently respond the russian use of nuclear weapons uh the sort of very overt threat that's been made uh it, worth remembering that it's been made before many times um including over the seizure of crimea but also worth remembering that there's decades of knowledge of how to manage strategic nuclear signaling between nuclear armed powers and so for the component of that signaling that is meant for the west and, you know, you've got various Russian pundits being trotted out to to kind of threaten London with being flattened and nuclear annihilation. Of the, you know, they seem to quite like the phrase, you know, turning the UK into a Martian desert and the various other sort of flurries, flourishes there. You know, it's never mentioned in any of that discourse that, of course, not only is NATO nuclear armed, but in the case of London, the UK has its own nuclear deterrent that is specifically capable of flattening Moscow. So, you know, it... it this is old Cold War deterrent stuff, and it's no more credible now than it was then in terms of being a realistic threat, um, because mutually assured destruction still applies to you know, a strategic exchange. If you go down to the more kind of lower end scale of, of nuclear use that might be that might be discussed or threatened, uh, either implicitly or explicitly. Um, so what people might term tactical nuclear weapons, which would tend to be weapons with a yield of between a thousand and around uh, 10,000 tons of TNT. Um, so the upper end is around the, around the Hiroshima blast. 
Um, they're actually, if you actually map them out, they're not huge weapons. They have a huge symbolic kind of shock value. Uh, and if they're ground bursted as opposed to air bursted, if you if you were looking for maximum destruction from a nuclear weapon, you would tend to air burst it so that the shock wave comes down and it reverberates mm -hmm. and the flash does more damage over distance. That tends to create less fallout. Um, but if you were to ground burst them, yes, you could you'd create a lot of nuclear fallout. You know, there's a few considerations that render that probably not particularly likely outcome. Um, on the effectiveness side of things, taking the morality and the kind of shock value out of it for a second, um, a single sort of demonstrative battlefield nuclear weapon or tactical nuclear weapon use, some people have suggested a small one of the Black Sea as a, as a potential kind of de demonstration, uh, is very, very unlikely to deter Kyiv. Um, remember, the Ukrainians have already had two of their major cities literally reduced to rubble. Um, they've lost you know, at least 100,000 killed um, in terms of civilians, um, coupled with you know, tens of thousands of military deaths and injuries. This is a very, very brutalized country that quite rightly um, is determined to fight and, and reclaim the territory that's been occupied, especially given that in every area that is liberated, we get more and more evidence of systemic Russian rapes, mass torture, executions. Um, and so, you know, in any country, if that was going on in your territory, of course, you'd be determined to take back and liberate your territory and liberate your people. So a symbolic use is very unlikely to deter Kiev at this point, especially given that they clearly have the military upper hand. Um, they have the initiative. And so then you think, well, OK, so how far up the scale would you want to go? Because in order to seriously change the balance of power on the battlefield, you would have to use lots of tactical nuclear weapons in multiple places, at which point, A, you're getting into completely uncharted territory in terms of how that escalation would play out potentially with the West, especially given that nuclear radiation and fallout would potentially be spread not only within Ukraine, but also into Europe and into Russia itself. Um, so there'd be potential self-defense arguments going on. There would almost certainly be a conventional response from the from NATO and the US um, of some sort. It might not be nuclear, but the West has plenty of levers that they haven't pulled yet. And it's also worth remembering, politically speaking, the idea of a nuclear first use against Ukraine. Uh, Russia doesn't have a nuclear first use policy, except in very specific existential threat to the state context, which are mapped out in Russian doctrine and which wouldn't apply here. Um, Putin is talking about the territorial integrity of Russia, clearly try using it to apply to these, these annexed territories. But that's not what Russian doctrine says. Um, and so, A, it would be a departure there. Internally, it would be a huge risk for him. There's already a lot of mumblings of discontent. It would be a huge risk for him to try and order, uh, order a nuclear use, because there's a, there's a very high chance that at that point, his own apparatus would decide, right, this has gone far enough and get rid of him. And also with all the sanctions that everything's that, that have been brought on in the Russian economy that are likely to be there for a long time, not only is Russia utterly economically dependent on China from here on out, but also in trying to reconstitute their military strength, however Ukraine kind of ends up, um, and at this point it looks like it'll end very badly for the Russians, um, they're going to have to reconstitute their military. And if the sanctions stay in place, there's only a few places they can get the components they need, and China's the most obvious one. So if they were to alienate China completely, and China's already openly exp expressed its displeasure with the Ukraine war so far, a, a nuclear first use against a non-nuclear armed power in Europe, I mean, frankly, at that point, even the Chinese and, and the Indians who are have so far kind of uneasily remained at least partly friendly with Moscow, uh, would also have to basically cut them loose. You know, it's not to be totally discounted, but just looking at it logically, it doesn't add up for them.